So um, if you go to the web page, you should see that there's a link. Week three, the first thing we're going to do is log in the knowledge seat to Socrative, um, which is the quiz system. And I see quite a few have done, quite a few of you have done that. Um, you can actually log in um, on, as an app on Android or iOS, um, but you can just log in via the web. So uh, this, this, is, this is my driving screen. And so I can see that there's uh, 15 people logged in. And so if you could answer that first question, the important thing to note is that there's some of these aren't questions, and uh, you may not realize if, you, if you, you've already answered, some of these questions can have multiple answers. So um, if, we, if I, uh, you can actually click on, um, uh, you, won't, you can click on more than one answer. If there are two answers, it will only let you select two, um, um, you know, two uh, particular versions. So you can kind of game the system. But it would be really good if people had a bash at answering this first question, uh, and I'll, then we can go on to the real quiz. But this is just to check the things. So I see that 10 people have answered, 11. So uh, just, as I said, if there's more than one, um, you can slightly game the system because if there's more than one answer, uh, you are allowed to click more than once. But if there's two answers, you can't click three times. So that's sort of the way it works. Uh, how did we do? Okay, so um, we generally got, most people got the message passing interface, but there were two answers here. It is, it is the message passing interface, but it's also a library for, for distributed memory parallel programming. And I think I have an explanation. No, I don't have an explanation here. But um, um, uh, nobody got the wrong answer, which is good, but uh, some people missed that it was a library for distributed memory parallel programming. So not all the questions, but some of the questions have more than one answer. So the next question I genuinely want to find out um, what, what the makeup of the audience is. Uh, my preferred choice of programming language is, so C or C++, and then I've tried to, I'm, I'm not very good with the Fortran, I've tried to categorize what kind of Fortran you program in. Are you, you know, Fortran 77, which I've got is old school, 72 column format, capitals, common blocks, and all that stuff. Uh, the second one, which is Fortran 90, I'm not being different, but it's kind of, you know, free format, array syntax, some allocates, a few modules, but nothing too fancy. Or are you Fortran 2008, very modern interfaces, derived types, all that, uh, and all that jazz. So just be interested to, to know what people are, what people are programming in. It'll help me slightly when I'm going through the, the answer, but it's also interesting just to know. For the purpose of this question, I had to select a right answer. Um, I can't remember which one I selected, but, um, So, okay, so we've had a few more people in. Oh, okay, good. So I'll just, I'll, I'll look, I'll see how did we do. And, um, okay, so roughly equals C, C++, um, and equals C, C++, and what I would call modern Fortran, but not the most recent one. That's useful. So there's a few people, that, that's very useful to know, thanks. Uh, nobody's admitting to doing all Fortran 77, and that's quite uh, pleasing to see. So the first question we're actually going to, Real question. Remember, there may be more than one answer. To run an MPI program requires special libraries, special compilers, special compilers, special libraries, a special parallel computer, or a special operating system. Now, none of these questions are, are trivial. I ask them because they're things which are commonly mis misunderstood, possibly because I've not taught them well enough. But you know, these are these are um, there's two points I want to make about these questions. A, none of them are stupid questions. So, you know, they're, 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 I think they're reasonably challenging. But also, this is a question about MPI, okay? All of these answers could be true for a general message passing. If I, if I said to you, we're going to use a message passing called, called XXX, does it need special compilers, special libraries, a special parallel computer, a special operating system? All of those could possibly be true for an arbitrary message passing system. However, I'm asking here about MPI in particular. So the, so the answers aren't stupid, all the answers are, in general, the answers I'm going to give are all perfectly reasonable answers, which could be true about a general message passing or parallel programming system. But I'm asking you here for what is true about MPI. So that's why they're quite challenging, that hopefully, I don't think any of them are stupid, none of them are obviously wrong. But, um, and if you don't know, just guess, because it is anonymous, I have no idea who you are. So I'd rather you just took a guess, we've got a few answers than and pondered for too long. So I have about 10 questions, so it's not going to take too long, hopefully. Okay. Okay. So 
Most people have special libraries. Now, again, special compilers is not a stupid answer at all. And in fact, um, there are two points here. One, you could design a message path. There have been message paths in systems before which have been enshrined in, in, in a language. Um, there was a language called, um, called Occam very long ago, around on transputers. You could compose channel based. You could think of it like message passing. But it turns out MPI doesn't need special compilers, it, it's purely a library. Now, the way MPI is packaged up makes it look like you have special compilers. You type MPI CC, you type MPI F90, but actually they aren't special compilers, they're just wrappers around normal compilers and they happen to link you to the right libraries. So it is slightly deceptive. You don't need a special parallel computer because any computer can run multiple processes and you don't need a special operating system to run MPI. All you need is an operating system which can run multiple processes and any operating system now, Windows, uh, Mac, OS X, Linux, or probably even Android can do that. So the next question, after initiating an MPI program with MPI run minus N4 my MPI program, what does the call to MPI init do? So we always say, you know, you, you write your MPI program and, you know, the first thing we do, whether it's C, C++ or Fortran, is you, you call MPI init. Uh, what does that call do? Yeah, most people answered, good. Okay, so, oh, I haven't got explanations here, okay. So, uh, a lot of people think it creates the four parallel processes and, and that's, you know, that could be true, but it actually doesn't. The way the MPI works is when you run, when you do MPI run minus N for my MPI program, at that point, four programs are running. Four copies of the same program are already running. And they would just run independently. So you could MPI run minus N for a serial program, and you would just get four serial copies running independently. All that um, MPI does is enables the four independent programs subsequently to communicate with each other. And again, this isn't obvious at all because um, if you if you never do anything before MPI init, you wouldn't see any difference. There are other programming models, like if you've done OpenMP, which is threads based, and I'll come back to the final question in a second, where actually the what you might think of the equivalent to MPI init, which are parallel regions, in OpenMP, they genuinely do create the four parallel threads. But the MPI model is the multiple processes are created by the MPI run command, in this case four, and they run independently from each other, except that when you call MPI init, they start to talk to each other. We don't create parallel threads. I mean, people tend to be reasonably free and easy about saying processes and threads, but they are different. And the important part about processes is that processes can't share memory with each other. They're independent. So, so an MPI is built on multiple processes, not threads. And um, it's not immediately obvious. And I'll, when I do the example program after this, I, I, the way I've written it tries to make this, this feature more obvious. So if you call an MPI receive and there is no incoming message, what happens? And again, there may be more than one answer here. Um, again, all of these are perfectly reasonable answers for a, a, an off-the-shelf message passing system, but not all of them are true for MPI. So does it receive with it, does the receive fail with an error? Does it receive report that there's no incoming message? Does the receive wait until the message arrives, potentially waiting forever? Or does it time out after some system specified delay? So it waits for a few minutes and says, I'm giving up. That's one, one answer of, uh, one advantage of doing this virtually. There's no chance of you catching what seems to be the cold that I'm developing. Okay, how did we do? So very well, okay. So again, um, the receive MPI is synchronous. And, uh, sorry, in MPI, receive is synchronous. I kind of, what people do quite well in this test um, often because I've, I've kind of, because these were things I noticed people were, were misunderstanding, I kind of teach to the test now. I'm glad to see if you pick this up. Um, the receive waits for the message arrive, potentially waiting forever. Again, you might think, why doesn't the receive time out? And there were message passing systems of your um, things like uh, PVM, Parallel Virtual Machine, which is around in the mid 90s, which I think had timeouts in it. You could set the timeout and say, like, if nothing happens, um, after um, you know five minutes, then 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 you know you're going to have to give up. And this is intimately tied to the fact that um, MPI doesn't really. I think I may have mentioned this in the answer to a question last week. MPI doesn't have any concept of fault tolerance. 
MPI's model is that the machine is perfect and always there. If you wanted to have a system which ran on a, on a, on a, a very distributed network, which could where some of the nodes could fall over every now and again, then you would want the receiver to time out. You'd want to say, look, if I'm not heard from somebody for 10 minutes, they've probably fallen over. But MPI assumes you've written a perfect program so there will be a message coming in and that the, the, and that the machine is 100% reliable so that at some point that message will be sent. So the, the fact that the there are no timeouts, the receiver waits forever, um, is, is tied to the fact that MPI isn't, isn't actually fault tolerant. So I haven't put any information in it, I'll confirm it. So if you call MPI synchronous send, MPI send, and there is no receive posted, what happens? So what I'm kind of exploring is the, 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 the final talk I gave last week, which was sort of, I had those diagrams of sender and receiver. Um, okay, so um, all of these are perfect, all of these are actually um, possible behaviors in MPI, and I'll come back to that, but with synchronous send, synchronous send, as most people have, have, have noticed, is like making a phone call. So you pick up the phone, it's synchronous, synchronous means you wait till somebody picks up the Till somebody answers, and you potentially wait forever. Now, the message is stored and delivered later on, if possible. That there is a way of doing that, but it's not synchronous send. And actually, the send fails. I haven't covered this, but there is a mode. In, this is talking about the mode. Here we're using synchronous mode. There is a mode in MPI which I don't even cover called ready mode. Ready mode has this behavior that basically, if you do a ready send called MPI R send. You should never use it. I used to mention it and tell people not to use it, and I decided that was a bit. Uh, so I think here's a big red button. Don't press it. Um, and ready send only works if there is a receive already posted. Otherwise, the, the the message disappears. That is, it's in there for historical reasons. It's not a useful uh, way of programming. It's very error prone. It's actually very difficult in MPI to arrange for the send to be to be posted before the receive. So all B, C, and D are all possible behaviors of sends in MPI, but it turns out that for synchronous send, the correct answer is C. The send waits until the receive is posted, potentially waiting forever. The next one um, is if you call MPI asynchronous send, which is MPI B send, and there is no receive posted, what could happen? Could the message disappear? Could the send fail? Could the send wait to receive is posted waiting forever? Is the message stored to live later on? If possible, send might time out uh, and or the program continues execution regardless of when the message is received. And remember, there are there are, there is in some of these questions, there is more than one possible answer. So this is actually getting quite challenging because I know you know it's not again, it's not immediately clear. Um, what happens here? And in fact, um, actually, it's, <laughs> when I originally posted this question, I had I, the, the, my answers were wrong. A student pointed out that uh, I had the answers wrong. So this is quite a tough question. Um, also, um, the only reason I really got to understand these things is that I was lucky enough that when I started at EPCC, there were people at EPCC who were developing MPI libraries. And so if ever there was a question, and we still have a couple of people around, my colleague Stephen has, has done that himself. But there were a lot, quite a few people around, and you could go and ask them these kind of subtleties because they obviously had to understand all this stuff when you're writing a library. No wait. So that's okay. So oh, apologies. I wanted to how to we do. So the message doesn't disappear. Um, doing an asynchronous send is like posting a letter, and the reason the message doesn't disappear is that MPI guarantees that it will deliver it at some point. So if you post a letter, um, you know, the postal service is 100% reliable. Uh, I'll come back, the send fails is actually a correct answer here. I'll come back to the one that I, that's difficult. The send waits will receive a post potentially waiting forever. No, that would be true for synchronous send, but not for buffered send. Buffered send is explicitly saying what an asynchronous send. So the obvious two answers are, which most people got was, the message is stored and delivered later on if possible. The program could use execution regardless of when the message is received. So this is, as I said, like sending an email. You send the email, 
It's delivered later on, if possible, if there is a Steve posted, but regardless of that, you carry on execution. However, B is also a correct answer because, uh, does anyone want to maybe hazard a guess as to why B is, I don't, uh, why is it possible um, for MPI B said to fail? This is the closest I have in this quiz to a trick question because it is a bit of a, and I, I, it was, I had actually, I had this wrong the first time I gave this quiz. B wasn't marked as a correct answer, but does anyone, if, we, if whoever said the send fails, could, is there any idea, was it just a guess or did you have a reason for that? Yes, exactly. No memory to buffer. So the strange thing about MPI B send is that it is up to the user to supply the buffering space. So you are mandating this message must be buffered, but, uh, but um, you may not have supplied enough buffer space. And so MPI B send can fail. So you have this problem that MPI synchronous send, you, you might wait around forever if, um, if there's no, no receive posted. MPI B send asynchronous circumvents that problem by saying, look, I'll just deliver the message and carry on. But the worry is it's up to you to have res reserved enough buffer space. And if you keep sending messages, the post box might fill up. So MPI send, as I tried to explain last week, and this is quite subtle, but tries to get round that, um, round that problem. So the next question is, if you call standard send MPI send, there's no match and receive, which of the following are possible outcomes? And this is the thing which I, I think I've been programming MPI for a year or so till I um, read something in the manual which didn't make sense to me. And I went and spoke to, um, it was Gordon Smith, who was one of the developers then, and he explained it to me. Of course, he understood it because he'd had to program it up in the library, but it's not immediately obvious from the standard um, what MPI send does. And why it's important to know what MPI send does, if someone gives you an MPI program or you write one, it's most likely you've used MPI send. It's called the standard send. Why wouldn't you use it? Um, like standard class, that's the obvious one to use. But uh, its behavior is not immediately obvious. And it's one of the, I guess, unfortunate things about MPI, but it was done for a good reason. So before I tell you how do we do, to explain that, what I was trying to get at last week is that MPI send is in some sense is the union of MPI S send and MPI B send. It's saying, look, MPI send can be synchronous or it could be asynchronous, i.e. buffered, but the system decides which. So you might think that the correct answers here are the union of the answers of questions six and seven. All the behaviors of MPI B send plus MPI S send are, 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 are allowable here. But in fact, the message doesn't disappear because again, MPI guarantees to, 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 um, to, um, to send it. I'll come back to why B is no longer true. So if MPI decides to send your message synchronously, this could happen. The send could wait until the receiver's post is potentially waiting forever. If the MPI decides to send the message asynchronously, then, it, then D and E happen. The message is stored and delivered later on if possible. The program continues the execution regardless of where the message is received. But, the send never fails. And the reason that, um, the, the reason the send could fail for an explicit B send is you are mandating, you must buffer this. If there isn't enough buffer space, MPI goes, I can't do it. The point about MPI send is it chooses to buffer or not to buffer, depending if, in practice on whether there is enough buffer space. So if there's enough buffer space, it will buffer. If there isn't enough buffer space, it, it goes into synchronous mode, it backs off. And so MPI send is supposed to give you the best of both worlds but omitting the chance that the send will fail B. So, so MPI send is trying to say, look, I'll try and do asynchronous because that's probably what you want, just send a message and get on. But rather than failing, if there's not enough buffer space, I will go synchronous. So I'll just wait for somebody to pick up the phone and then we can carry on. And by that time, presumably some of the buffer will have cleared out. And so um, that's, that's the rationale of MPI send. But the important point is that that threshold between which it decides to go buffered or synchronous is not, is decided by the library. It's completely different from this memory MPI buffer attach you attach for, for explicit vSense. You may have indirect control over that by weird and wonderful incantations and um, environment variables. But the basic idea is MPI decides when to switch between these two modes 
and you don't really know when that is. You'd have to look up the manual. It's not defined in the standard. The standard says MPI can do either. The reason is it allows MPI to do this synchronously if it, if it, if it needs to, but, but, but asynchronous it can. But that, that threshold is something that you could either find by looking up in the manual. I usually find it experimentally by sending a bigger and bigger message to the deadlocks. And, but you know it's on synchronous. I mean, that's, that's a standard metric. If it goes synchronous, does MPI keep changing? Yes. So again, the rationale is that it will wait for the receive to happen. Uh, oh no, if it goes synchronous, no, I think. In practice, I think MPI decides when you call it, am I synchronizing? In principle, there's no reason that MPI could go, oh, I decided to do this synchronously, now I'll do it asynchronously. So in principle, the standard doesn't say anything about this. In principle, MPI could just basically. Uh, but I think in practice, what happens is that it, it, you know, you, at the time you initiate the send, it checks if there's enough buffer space. If it is, it buffers it. If there isn't, it goes synchronous. You're right. It could spin and, you know, it could in practice, in principle, spin and, and keep checking. I doubt the decision is global for the whole job. Um, no. What, well, the threshold is global, but. Um, it's done on a point-to-point -point basis. So, for example, if I'm rank zero and I'm communicating a lot with rank one, and I do a lot of, and I do a um, quite, I, I think, I think in practice, what MPI does is it actually just says messages below eight kilobytes are sent asynchronously. Messages above eight kilobytes are sent synchronously. Um, um, so there's a global threshold. Um, you can imagine that a particular pair of processes might, a particular process might use up all its buffering um, very quickly. Uh, and then, so I don't quite know the details. Um, I believe in practice it will wait, yes. I believe, in, I believe in practice what will happen is it will wait on the signal send even if all the other the buffer is clear by some other sense. That's what I think will happen. I would have to speak to a, uh, I, I think it would be quite, um, because actually what happens when you do a synchronous, when you do, when you do sorry, I can't see, when you do a synchronous send, which sounds like asynchronous, when you do synchronous send, what you actually do is you do send a message, but you send a little header message. You actually say to somebody, look, I've got a message I want to send to you. Uh, it's like a dial tone. I've got a message I want to send to you. You know, when you pick up this header, get back to me and I'll send you the message. So that's why in practice it can't back off. Once it's decided to send a message synchronously, it's already sent the header and it, it's waiting for somebody to acknowledge that. And then, then, they get, then they're on the line. To get it. So, it's, so the header is effectively a dial tone. You're ringing and then you wait for it to pick up. That's all the implementation. It, it, you know, MPI, I think, in principle, would be allowed to do this more dynamically, but I don't think it does. Um, it would be constantly looking, yes, although MPI does have to constantly look because when I do the sync, when I do synchronous send, I can't, I, I say I wait for the other person to pick up, but actually it's the send that waits for the other person. I still have to process other things because there could be receives coming in. So when I say MPI waits in the send, in fact, it's the send that is blocked, but actually MPI is go going off and, and, and keeping things, it, it's, MPI tries to keep things moving under the hood. So in some situations, it does keep looking. Um, that's a good, I, don't, I maybe need to ask a developer for the, for the internet. So um, I've got a few more questions, just a couple more, I think. Um, the NPI receiver routine has a parameter count. What does this mean? Again, I, I explained this last week, but it's not obvious at all. So when you do a receive, you say, I would like to receive, uh, and there's a count parameter in the receive. Is that the size of the incoming message in bytes? The size of the incoming message in, 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 in terms of integers? The size available for storing the message in bytes, the size available for storing the messages in items, e.g. integers. And again, all of these could be true and have been true in different message passing systems in the past. Um, but with MPI, there's a there's a it's defined what it is. So I'll I'll go on. This is quite a hard one. Let's see how people did. Okay, so um, so most people got it right. 
which is very good. The size of it will store the message in, in items. Um, the straight, well, the thing about MPI, uh, okay, so I'll, well, I will come back to that. That's probably the next question, actually. But um, when you do a set of receive, it's, it's not obvious what actually, the, the count is saying how much you're saying, I want to receive a message from a sender, so you receive from a particular sender, but you're actually saying, this is how much memory I have reserved for that incoming message. And so it is the size available to store the message in items, e.g. integers. MPI tries not to talk about bytes, so um, it could be the size available to store the message, but it's not. Because when you do a receive, you say count and a type. So you say, I want to receive six integers. So MPI knows it can do the multiplication. You want, you know, David wants to use six integers, that's six times four, that's 24 bytes. So, so MPI tries to avoid talking about bytes. Uh, you might, it, it's perfectly rational to think that the uh, that, that count is the size of the incoming message in items, i.g. in integers, but it's technically not. In many programs it is. You might know that all your messages are 10, in, 10, 10, 10 items long, so then count equals 10, you know the incoming message is size 10, but technically it isn't. It's the, the, the count is the size of the local storage. So the next question obviously is, well, I'll come back to Victor's question in a couple of slides. What happens to the incoming messages larger than count? So the people that tend to get this question wrong are people who've actually done a lot of a lot of of, of, of their of network programming before because MPI MPI is designed for a scientific technical program and MPI is designed for performance. And so its behavior is not what you would expect had you have you already done distributed programming when a lot of distributed programming talking about communicating in the internet between machines all over the world is very much targeted at resilience and robustness, not so much about performance. MPI throws everything out the window in sacred performance. And what happens here is, um, okay, so that's interesting. So the receive actually fails with an error. Now, you might think of the first count, that's a perfectly reasonable, and so I, this is, I think only the first count items are received. The problem with that is that, um, why isn't, if you did that, it would be a bit, it's not clear, you've lost data and it's not clear how to um, how to keep going. So what you might think, and people have done, some people think that when you send a message, some people think if you send a message of 20 integers, you could receive that message with two receives of 10 integers. They, they think of data transfer and MPI being like a pipe, data going in one end and out the other. That's not the way MPI works. Men MPI works on matching messages sent and received. So one send matches one receive on a per message basis. So if you send 20 integers and you say I want to receive 10, it's going to fit. Now MPI could just deliver the first 10, but probably that's not what you want. You probably made a mistake. And in fact, there will be no way to recover from that because the remaining, you'd have to, you'd have to get back the person, tell them to resend. And again, in a robust dynamic networking environment, that, that's what you'd have. You'd have retries. But MPI is saying, look, we want to be fast, message match messages, yes or no. But actually, if the incoming message is larger than count, the receive fails with an error. And in MPI, by default, errors are fatal, so your program will crash and burn, dump core, all kinds of horrible things. So um, this is a, this is a, this is a lot of people think D is true, and it sounds reasonable. But I think the the reason why it's not true is that it's not clear how you would recover from that, because the MPI model is you know you would have to actually resend those remaining extra data and that would be, you'd spend all your time, the sender would have to constantly check had the data got there effectively. And so I think that's why it's not done, but that, that's an interesting one. What happens to the incoming message if size n is smaller than count? I will come to Victor's question in French if I haven't realized it was so down. So this is the other one. Is this an error? Are the first n item received, are the first n item received and the rest of the data is storage is zero? So this is, I mean, I have seen some MPI courses, which are maybe not as pedantic as mine, but that sort of do send and receive in the first lecture on the first day. And, you know, but I, I, the reason for asking these questions is that you'd be, it's surprising, and I was surprised, um, how many non-trivial questions you can ask just about simple send and receive. And the answers are not obvious. And MPI has made particular design decisions, which mean that in MPI, you know, these, these questions have, have prescribed answers, but it's not then, if you had been on the MPI course, none of these answers would be obvious at all, I don't think anyway. 
the NPI manual is not a, um, a book for general reading, but it does, I find often the most useful part of the NPI manual is there's often a rationale. They'll give a, they'll give a routine, there'll be a rationale for implementers and a rationale for users. And the rationale for users is often saying, well, this helps you in this situation. And the rationale for implementers is, is often saying, look, it has to be this way because otherwise it would take, it wouldn't be fast. So that's often a, a good place to look if you're interested in the insights of MPI. Indirectly, you can look at the rationale for various routines and that can sometimes help you, at least give you a, an inkling of what the, what the considerations were. So if you just want to have a guess, as I said, these are not easy questions at all. So just guess if you don't know. So I'll do how do we do? Okay, so um, the receipt doesn't fail with an error. It's actually legal in MPI if you ask. So what you're saying is, I would like to receive a message, please, and I have, I have reserved 10 integers. If a message of five integers come in, that does actually match, which isn't obvious. Uh, so, so given that the messages match, what happens? The first ten items are received, but is the rest of the storage zeroed? Well, the first ten items are received, but the storage isn't zeroed. I think the reason is um, you can basically this would take time. I think we, in reality, why you know if you reserved a megabyte and received a byte, you'd be a bit annoyed if MPI went away and, and um, um, I'm going to be do power of ten here, but zeroed uh, nine hundred nine nine thousand. 999 bytes of data that takes quite a long time so i think this is really i mean you can think of situations where zero might open, might corrupt data but i think the real reason is you know what it, it doesn't it doesn't zero the data so the final question which hopefully answers what victor is saying is uh, how is the actual side of the incoming message reported so we've issued a receive with a certain count saying how much storage we have a message is coming, which is smaller than count, which means the incoming message fits into the, into the reserve storage and therefore is a valid receive. But then how do I know how much of my receive buffer is valid? Because it's not the end isn't zero or anything. It's just you know, some of it has been received into, the rest has been untouched. I need to know how much was, um, how much was, was touched. We've got a good set of answers in, so I'll have a look. How do we do? So, uh, MPI could update the value of count, um, but it doesn't. Um, in C, you can probably tell that because you pass a variable, not a point. In Fortran, it's not obvious, but no, the value of count doesn't isn't isn't updated. You you could you couldn't you could encode the size of the tag, but that's not how it's done. So, MPI, if you think about it, MPI does need to be able to tell you though. I mean. It, if, you, if you've got a message that's come in which is smaller than the buffer, you, you need to know how much data came in, otherwise you don't know what to do. And, and this is the status parameter. So when you issue a receive, you specify two pieces of storage, you specify the, um, the buffer, the receive buffer where the data goes, but you specify the status, which is an area of storage and see it's a structure, in Fortran it's just a little block of memory, uh, where the status parameter is. And there is a call to allow you to and so what you to answer Victor's question, there's a routine called MPI get count, which will say how many integers were received. MPI doesn't like to talk about bytes, but if you wanted to get in bytes, you would just multiply it by size of integer. But what MPI will tell you is how many integers were received. I don't know if that answers your so the answer to your question is the number of items received is stored in the status. And if you want that in bytes, then you multiply out the size of the object. But it is, again, MPI tries not to talk about bytes. I know C programmers love bytes, but um, OK. So um, I don't know if it's worked. So I'll, um, that's what happens. Um, oh, finish. Sorry, I need to finish. So this is the various chart, which I have not. Um, oh, so that's so, Okay, some people did. I don't know. I don't have any names. I don't really want looking at here. Okay, so that was the quiz. So what I want to do next, if you look at the timetable, is I'm not going to have a lecture until after the break. I'm going to go through the pie solutions. Hopefully, it isn't ramming in too much. But I, I will, I will um, go through the pie solution to last week because uh, I think it illustrates quite a few of these issues. So I'll just quick switch now and share a different screen. 
and I'll also give me an opportunity to tell you a slight um, so you should see that I am on um, the IDF here. Now, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compile the um, the, uh, the pipe. A bit small, David. Is it a bit small? Okay. So I should, do you want me to, maybe I should stop the quiz. I, actually, I've done something stupid. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's basically saying, um, that's just saying that I haven't, I, I, I'll need, I didn't, I quit in an ugly way. I didn't end the quiz, so apologies. So I have finished the quiz. It's just that it's just the page now shows that, um, uh, it's, yeah, I, I'll need to log in and, 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 and kill it. So thanks, Claire. I will. Um... So, uh, well, it was anonymous. I, I, tr I, can, I can find a spreadsheet which shows how people did, but whether, um, I, because it's anonymous, um, uh, because it's anonymous, I can go back in. I'll do that. I'll maybe do that over the break and I'll find the table. You might be able to spot yourself. Um, I'm not an expert on that. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, change setting. That a bit better, a bit bigger, I think, isn't it? A bit bigger again, but I don't know if that's is that large. That should be sixteen point. I think that's what I used before. Um, so first of all, I will. You'll see it's on the. Uh, it's on the web page, the Pi solution. So I'll just double get that on our on them. Um, um, on uh, Cirrus, and I can unpack it. And you'll see if I list, there are, um, it calls, um, sorry, it creates a, 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 a folder called MPPPy. And there are four subdirectors, CC plus plus four, F and F away. So what I will do is I will just um, I will just look at the C one to start with. Now, um, unfortunately, um, the there has been a system update um, since the last time we used the idea. And what you should do now, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure this is documented online, but you shouldn't play around with the modules. Um, I'll, I'll explain why I wanted to do that before. It doesn't work now. But if you just you just want to type MPICC minus O, I think there's a make file, isn't there? Yeah, I can just type make. But I didn't load any modules. And um, if I run this program on one process, Pi Parallel, you'll see that unfortunately what you get is a lot of errors here. These are spurious errors. Now, the module shenanigans I told you to do before were a way of getting rid of these errors by reverting to very old pieces of software, which, which were enough, very old installations of MPI, which were enough for this course. I think in the, um, in the system update, probably because of the meltdown bug, I think that's probably why I did it, these old versions were removed. Um, they, I just found them lying around. They weren't really documented. So you're, by using the default modules, you are using a most up-to-date version of MPI and up-to-date version of the compilers. Unfortunately, they have been configured for the, 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 the main compute nodes, which are hanging off the back end. We're on the login node. And the upshot is the programs run, but unfortunately, you get this warning here. It's saying something like there's something wrong with the network. I, I think it's the main computer has InfiniBand networking, maybe this login node doesn't. I think it's saying something like that. So apologies, you will get all this. That was why I had the, the module shenanigans before. But if we just ignore this stuff here, we'll see we get at the bottom. Hello from rank zero, running one processes on rank zero. I started one, I stopped it, and you get the correct value of pi. I only ran on one, so let's, I'll show you the program now. So, um, so this is a very simple program, but I'll go through it a bit by bit. 
We include the standard libraries, but then here we category the MPI by H. This is the, the this magic number N, which is the, the number of divisions and computing pi over the, 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 the maximum value in the series. That's not very really particularly useful. Double pi, exact pi. Um, so, my MPI values, MPI com, com, MPI status, status. So, as I said, in C, these, these handles, we call them communicator, and the status are, are type def. You could look in the MPI, these will just be defined in MPI.h. The communicator is some magic variable. The status is a little structure. You do, you do them like this, MPI com, com, MPI status, status. I need some normal variables, rank, size, sort, and type to store various pieces. I need some other stuff here. I stop, I stop, partial pi and receive pi. So, the first thing I do is I print computing approximation to pi on go down a bit. I do a print before MPI init. And this is basically there to show you that at, even at this point here, multiple MPI processes are running. So if I run on, on four processes, you'll see that, apologies for all this, this rubbish at the start, but you will see that uh, you get one person saying computing to pi, approximation to pi, sorry, uh, it's, it's, I'm doing, uh, where did I do it? Yes, sorry, it's computing approximation to pi using any predict force. You get, you get that print statement four times. So that's there to illustrate two things. A, in practice in MPI programs, you should protect your print statements with if rank equals zero. If it's a global print, just so that only one person prints them. But the important point is that, um, that, that, that all these processes are running before MPI in it. I go back to the code, we do the normal thing, we say com equals MPI com world. I could hard code MPI com world in here, but I think it's more elegant to set to a variable. Now I do MPI net null null, MPI com size, com size, MPI com rank, com rank, and I say hello from rank whatever, and then I want the print statement. So, so I'll get hello from rank zero, rank rank, rank, rank two, and rank three, and then um, if rank equals zero print running on so many processes. Okay. So we've seen that. And what I do is I want to compute an approximation to pi using the simple series summation. And what I do here is I did what I, I, I told we should do last time. I do an SPMD model where every process illustrates executes this code. But what you do is you compute I start and I stop based on your size and your rank. So I divide the iteration space up into blocks of n over size. So on, on size equals four, n equals 840, that's 210. And I start goes from rank times that plus one to, and you have to twiddle around with the edges here. Now, um, the reason I do this print here on rank whatever, I start is this, I stop equals that, is that this code only works if you get I start and I stop correct. If you get these, and it's very easy to get these wrong by plus or minus one. It's not obvious that that should be plus one, that should be minus one here. Um, a lot of people write the code, they get the wrong answer, and they stare at it for hours and hours. I just print stuff to the screen, you know. So you know, you know, if you get those previous lines wrong, you'll just be able to see on the screen that the, 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 um, that the intervals don't match up. So I'm a great believer in, people say don't debug with printf, but I, I'm a great believer in printing information to the screen and debugging it. You wouldn't do this in a real program because you get hundreds of these. But. So each... We don't need multiple variables partial pi. We only need one variable because it's SPMD. Although we have one variable called partial pi, each of our four processes, not one, two, three, has their own. And I don't have my but, uh, machine, but you can think and you know, imagine, um, you know, one of the processes, they're running on four different laptops. So each of them has its own value of partial pi. So if we just basically, um, and that, 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 it's quite obvious to see that's going to work, but now we want to basically add them up. Now, you really ought to, when you're adding numbers together globally, you should use a, a collective routine, which I actually mentioned in the introductory lecture, the concept lecture, which is called reductions. But as a, a learning example, we should all use send and receive. So I'm saying, I'll try and get this centered. Let's see, well, there's an if rank equals zero. So rank zero we've nominated as, as, the, as the, 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 the uh, controller, the controller worker scenario. There's no reason for rank zero to be the controller, but it's conventionally the controller. So, but what I'll do is I'll go to the other side of this branch here. So everyone else is sending their partial value to rank zero. So we'll, we're not going to use tags in this in this code, but we'll set them to a global value of zero. 
I'm sending, I'm, I'm sending to rank zero, and I'll do, I'll do synchronous send on my partial value of pi, that's part of pointer because of C wants a, the way C works. It's one double. So I've declared this as a double precision number. My definition is double partial pi. When I send it, I have to tell the send routine what I'm sending. So I have to say I'm sending one MPI double. This is just a magic number, but it just allows MPI to understand that you're sending doubles. Languages like C don't pass type information. So, so the call routine down below can't know what is being sent. You have to tell it. Um, sending two rank zero with a tag which happens to be zero within Commonwealth. So, so what I then need to do, so why don't we check the return error? So I mentioned this lot, we should check the return error. We ought to check the return error and a good programmer would, but I'm not a good programmer. The real reason is that by default, if there are any errors, MPI calls an error handler which crashes. The default behavior is to crash. So you can religiously put if statements in here if 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 error is is so what you really ought to do that's a very good question if i should say error equals mpis send let's let's do that error i ought to do this i ought to do if Error is not equal to, and there's a magic variable MPI success. Oops. Print there. Okay. So um, that, and then we can. We, unfortunately, if there was an error, MPI send will will actually crash and never get back. Now you can change not. Not all MPI routines crash on top, almost all of them do. You can change that behavior. You can tell it to not abort on error. But because the default behavior is to abort on error, MPI programs tend to be lazy and don't check the error code. Uh, those who do normally have a macro, they'll have some macro, which is, um, which is maybe, you know. So that's, that's just, uh, so, 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 if we're running on four processes, three of them are sending, the thing that some people get wrong is rank equals zero has to now explicitly do three receives. It has to receive, because rank, you've got n processes, n minus one of them are doing a send, but one of them needs to do n minus one receives. We need an explicit loop. We need to issue more than one send. We can't just do one, we issue, sorry, we need to issue more than one receive. We can't just have a receive because each receive, they're not persistent, each receive matches a send and then it's over. So you have to, if you want to do receive three messages, although they're coming from different people, you have to issue three receives. So I have an explicit loop here. For source equals one, source less than size, source double plus. I print and receive from any, uh, I then, what I do is I do receive, I want to, I've got a separate variable called receive pi, I receive one double into it, and I'm receiving from any source. So I'm doing a wild card here. I'm saying, look, I don't care where this comes from. I'm receiving from anybody. It has to be tag, com, and I want the metadata to go into status. The reason I do MPI any source is, at this point, I don't know where the message came from. Now, for this example, I don't really care. But another one I might, is in a real program, I probably want to say, well, you've just sent me some data. I need to send data back to you. I can't send data to MPI any source. It's meaningless. I have to specify a source as a destination for the send. So when I do, if I were to do a send, I need to know where it came from. And that is stored in this variable, in this component of the structure status, status dot MPI source, and I'm just printing out here, print rank, you're receiving from rank, whatever. And then I add to the running total. So people often say, you know, why well, don't, there aren't there automatic tools to, to, to detect problems in MPI for programs. It's really quite complicated, but this code only works because N minus one of the processes enter this branch and do a single send, and one of the processes enters this branch and does N minus one explicit receives. And, that, and remember, I've got rank here. Um, well, I've got things like um, my rank variable. I mean, the, the compiler doesn't know that rank is set to the rank. That's just a convention. It could be called anything. It could be called be Billy or, or Glasgow, the variable. So, you know. I mean, it, it, it's very difficult for tools to spot any problems. So what I will do is I will, I'll run this maybe on 
eight processes to illustrate two things. So, what I'll do first of all is I will um, I will um, just grep out um, the receiving. I will. Sorry. I'm going to have to get rid of all this annoying. So what I want is I only want those messages which were expressed, and uh, I'll, I'll get rid of. I'm just getting rid of error messages here. But the first time I run it, I did that. The next time I ran it, I got that. So you can see that you know rank zero the first time it received from five, one, two, three, four, six, and seven. And the second time it received them in order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But the reason that that is not deterministic is because I'm doing a wild card. So it just happens to be at, at runtime, it's a first come, first served. So th this program is not deterministic in the sense that um, the order that I receive the, um, the variables in, it can, can, can vary. The other thing that people get wrong is they think that the order of these print, they think the order of these print statements is significant. So for example, rank five sending to rank zero and then rank three sending to rank zero. They think that means that rank three sent to rank zero after rank five. It doesn't. Each process writes to, to the screen in order, okay? The output from a particular process will appear in order. But the I.O. system, the shell or whatever, puts them together in a random order. I mean, each of these processes is just printing to the screen, whatever that means. There's layers and layers and layers of buffering, so who knows at what how they, 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 um, they um, uh, what, what order they come out of. So the individual prints from a particular process are guaranteed to come out in order. But between processes, it's not meaningful. So just because this hello from rank six appears after hello from rank four does not mean that that's the order they actually ran in. They maybe ran you know, a few microseconds or milliseconds before or after each other. By the time it's gone through all the layers of IO buffering, that difference is lost. So, so you can't ascribe meaning to the order of the print statement, except for a particular process, they do come out in order, but you can't ascribe meaning, unless you do clever things to flush the, the, the IO. Like that. So that's nothing that people get wrong. Um, you might be a bit concerned that, um, what I'll do is I'll print out pi to a better precision here. Um, let's print pi out at the bottom to, um, A lot of um, precision. I'll run it again on eight, and we'll see the value of pi was. Oh, I can't use do printf. Apologies. I want to be stupid. I'm fixing the CN4 can Sorry. So. Pi was was at three point one four one five nine two seven seven one six nine two five nine four three six five one. Now this isn't the exact value of pi because we only did a eight forty uh, partition, but, but it ended in six five one. Let let let's just grep out. Really, that value which is cool. Let's get that out. Run it again, again, and we're going to see it. Some point, I think I'm going to get a different answer. No, I ought to at some point get a different answer. It's not working. Here. Maybe if I run on more processes. So let's run on 24, for example. Let's say 20. There. So here I run on 20 processes and I get that value of pi. And you will see that sometimes I get a different value. So it's quite a small difference. It's down here. But I've run the same program twice and it's given me different values of pi. Why is that for this program that I've run? And what has it a guess? It's to do with the way I'm doing the receives. If you remember, um, When I do the receive, I've got this wild card. So the code is receive a value, add it to my running total. Receive a value, add it to my running total. Why can that give different answers when I run it more than once? 
if you want to have it hazard a guess. So I mean, the reason is that I'm not receiving it in any particular order. The first time I run it, I might receive from zero, then one, then two, then three, then four. So I'm adding, sorry, from one, so I'm adding contribution zero plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven, not the way. The next time I run it, it might be the other way. I might be adding, adding them the other way. I might get the 23rd, then the 22nd, all the way back down again. And because these are floating point numbers, finite precision, you add things together in a different order, you get different answers. Neither of them is right, neither of them is wrong. They're just, just different. And you would expect the difference is single precision, double precision numbers are accurate to about 16 decimal places. So we'd expect the error to be the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14. It's around about the 14th. It's that, that's the kind of place you'd expect this to be reduced to rounding errors. The way to fix that is rather than doing a receive from MPI any source, I can actually specify the order. I can say, look, I want to receive. At the, at the moment, this is just a counting loop. This is just saying, I want to do N minus 1 receives. But if I do this, and I'm actually saying here, I want to receive from a particular source, okay? So if I do a make, and we, we run, you'll see that I always get the same answer um, whenever I run. However, that's not particularly efficient because you know I'm, I'm mandating what to receive from one, two, three, four, five, maybe 20 is ready and I'm waiting um, for, to receive from 20. So as it says in the code as a comment, what you should really do if you want to do this operation is to do, use a reduction operation. We'll cover those next week, um, which, which, which do this all for you and in much more efficient ways than this. But this is a very good learning example. I'll cover this four time rest but I just wanted to, to point out, somebody asked, um, Birmingham asked, uh, why do we check the receiver? Let's make a deliberate mistake. And let's send to, where were we? MPI send to uh, not rank one, uh, not rank zero, sorry, but to rank 100, okay? That's incorrect unless we run on uh, more than 100 processes. If we run again for MPI run, and it's N20, now oh, let's do eight, uh, four, plus slash five parallel, we get a, uh, a nasty message. So we never see that oops message because rank three, um, well, they're printing the wrong thing, right? Sending to rank 100, but an error occurred in MPIS send reported by a particular process. I presume this means it might be rank three. MPI error rank, invalid rank. So, so basically, this was saying you issued a send and it had an invalid rank. And as it says here, the default MPI, the default error hand that MPI errors are fatal. So we've got a lot of horrible output here, but it's crashed and burned. And you'll see we never got that. Although MPI detected the error, rather than reporting an error code, cleanly, it just dies, and that's the default behavior. You can alter that, but that's what MPI does. So typically, MPI doesn't, isn't particularly elegant in reporting errors. Um, so, um, yes, it's it basically, it's, 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 um, it's got a bit unhappy. But, you know, you should check the error codes, but be aware, by default, they will almost never be reported because the, it will crash. So, so um, the default error behavior, there may be a global way of doing it, but, the, but the, the correct way to do it is that every communicator has an error handler attached to it. By default, that error handler is something called MPI errors are fatal, which is a function which just dumps core and burn, crashes and burns or calls a port. You can write your own error handlers and register them. So you can register your own error handler, MPI com, MPI error handler create. There's, I don't cover it, but, but it, is, it is there. So you can, error handles associated with the communicator. So for example, if you wrote a library routine, you would create your own communicator for that library routine. It would A, allow you to have insulated communications from the parent code, but also allow you to have your own error handler. Say, look, within this library routine, if I get an error, I'm gonna report a message cleanly up the way and not just crash and burn. So that's the way you do it. Um, MPI error. Uh, MPI uh, I'm gonna get this wrong. 
Okay. Anyway, it's, it's something like that. I might be error, but, um, and you attach them to, to communicate. Um, so uh, I'll go through the Fortran version because there are quite a few Fortran programmers. I go up the way. Um, I won't compile it because it, it, it just runs. Um, but if I show you the Fortran version, uh, I can't remember that, 90. It's very similar. Use MPI, which is the, this is the Fortran 90 interface, which, with sort of the style which most of you are programming in, in my classification. We just have, the only thing is in MPI, things like the communicate, because the, the Fortran, this interface for MPI was defined a long time ago before MPI had derived types. Um, things like communicator, right? Communicator are just um, integers, they're not types, they're not of type MPI common, it's an integer, and the status is little array. MPI handler sets, yes. And then, yeah, it's, uh, you have to do MPI, there'll be, you'll, you'll have to, I can't remember the, the procedure, but yes, the, there is the, that there 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 are error handler routines which allow you to, to, to manipulate this thing. Um, this is just the same as the C version, except that every function has an error code: MPI and I error, MPI com size com size I error. All the same. All the same here. This is the same code, but the difference is. Uh, Again, in four time, you have to remember that the, the ranks run from 0 to n minus 1, which is easy to get, sources one size minus 1. When I do MPI receive, this is a difference. There's a couple of differences here. First of all, in Fortran, double precision numbers are called MPI double precision, because in Fortran, they're not double x, it's double precision x. These are the old typing. Um, so it's of type MPI double precision. You have to do an error code at the end, and the status is an array. So if you want to know who it came from, it's, it's the MPI source entry of this little array. So the MPI, MPI status size will be like eight, some small number. MPI source will be something with three. It'll be saying, I store, this is various from implementation to implementation, but it might be saying, in this little array of size eight, the source is stored in position three. Um, and other than that, the four time working just the same. I capitalize it just for, um, just for, um, that's the Fortran version. Now, if those of you who, a couple of you were more modern programmers, I do have this. I don't think we can compile this version. But we can, okay. So uh, the Fortran, with the, the up-to-date compilers, the unfortunate side effect is you get these runtime error messages where it's complaining about there being no network or something. But the upside is that you do get the Fortran 2008 interface. So if we show you the code, So you use MPI F08, which is saying uh, they're the same routines under the hood, but you're calling them in a Fortran, more modern Fortran way. And I don't have these on the slides yet, I should put, but basically it's the same as the C thing. In C, you do MPI com com, MPI status status, MPI data type. Um, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, but in Fortran, it's just type MPI com com, type MPI status. So, so the MPI F08 module just defines C uh, Fortran structures or, or derived types, as they're called. Just uh, so, so, so it's a bit more elegant. The other thing that is um, so, I can do com ex MPI com world. When I, this, I don't have to specify I error. So again, modern Fortran has has um, function overloading. So if you don't specify, if you specify two parameters, it knows that well he hasn't specified I error, so I'll just ignore it. That would be a bad thing to do with it for the end of Fortran 90 interface because it would try and set I error and it wouldn't exist and you might get a crash, but it's clean in the Fortran one, in the Fortran 2008 version. Um, so when we do a send, as a comment, we could just set MPI real type plus MPI double precision, but if you're a modern Fortran program, you'll say, well, I don't use this float MPI real MPI, I don't do real double precision. I use Fortran's built in quite sophisticated type specification mechanism. So, what we have to say is I've written a program which has a value pi, which is a certain type. If I'd written a double pi, which I have, uh, what have I written actually? I've written uh, real kind equals 8 pi, but that does that mean that it's a double position? Well, I never quite know, but, but what you can, or you could have done real, you could have declared this in quite some convoluted ways in Fortran. 
what you want to do is you can say put NPI size or pi real size and we'll NPI type map. This is a bit convoluted. What it's basically saying is um, give me an NPI type, which I call the NPI real type, uh, which is enough to store this real value. So it's a bit convoluted, but it has to be because Fortran's type system is, is quite complicated uh, as opposed to C. Uh, and so there's this complicated way of saying, I've got this variable which I've declared in a certain way. Give me the MPI variable that I have to use to send that and send statement. So in this code, I could have just said MPI real type equals MPI double precision, it would have worked. I want to try the general code. And then the rest of it is just the same. Um, we do MPI send. We do NPI receive any source, and then this is where I uh, ah. So uh, I don't need error variable, and in in the fourth and two thousand eight um, um, incantation, the uh, status variable is a uh, I'm going to say structure, but NPI calls them derived type. Yeah, uh, where you index with a percent. So this is just um, status percent NPI source. So it looks more like the C interface. Um, NPNS, and so I don't need to specify the error. So the differences are the variables are typed, and you don't need to specify I error. And you, there is a more sophisticated way of inquiring about types. Um, I don't know if that made sense, but if you're so, so, so uh, the Fortran interface, Fortran 2008 interface, the Fortran 90 interface to NPI is something of a hack. Um, it works, but it's not particularly elegant. The Fortran 2008 one is much more modern, but you have to buy into it wholesale. Um, um, but it is a, it's more modern, and it, it's fully, um, it's much better, um, it's much better supported. The reason you should probably use the MPI 2008 interface is that, uh, I have a few seconds here. Let's go to the Fortran version. It's only for Fortran program, but let's make a mistake. Here's a receive routine. Let's just forget half the arguments. Yeah? Uh, okay, so it does work there. Okay, so it, it depends. Some systems using the Fortran 90 interface don't pick up prototype errors, mismatches between caller and callee. It's a site subtlety. The problem is that MPI routines. If you think about it, this MPI routine here, this MPI receive, is a, a Fortran function that takes a data type of arbitrary, arbitrary type. There's, there's, not a, there's not an MPI receive integer, an MPI receive double, an MPI, there's one MPI receive routine. It is illegal in Fortran to have a function which accepts an arbitrary type. Uh, however, in, in the Fortran 2008 world, you can tell the Fortran compiler, look, this is actually a C routine. So don't care. That, that's how it all works. So um, the MPI, the 2008 interface, tends to be more better for, deep, for, for picking up errors. I do have a C++ version there. I should probably delete it because, uh, oh no, I have, um, I've corrected it. I, so this is just basically the same as the C version. This is trying to, this, sorry, I have corrected this. Uh, it's basically just a C program because the MPI routines are C, a C call. So you just you can call them to C++. This is just a C program where I've got a few, instead of prints, I've got C outs. So it's really just there for completeness. It's just showing you that, unfortunately, although you may have a nice, elegant, object oriented language like C++, when you call the routines, you just have to call them as if they're C routines, which they are. So um, that's really the only, um, um, all I have to do, I've finished a few minutes early. I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but if not, then we'll just. Um... Right, if you're, ah, okay, that's a very good question. So, um, no, so what you can do, is you would do, you could do something like, uh, you could do integer, Dimension of array. And you allocate array of ten ten. 
And then you could do call MPI send of array to count, count and you do a hundred. And that works because um, if you were a purist, you would reshape. If you're a model, but, but if you're an old Fortran programmer like me, you know that actually um, uh, array is just a block of 100 integers. And that is defined in Fortran, that a, that a 2D array of 10 by 10 is actually just a single particular block of 100 integers. So you can't, that is legal to do. That is legal to do there. there. Um, it works. Um, uh, you could, if you were a real purist, you would do a reshape, but there's no need. The reshape is done for you. And for receive, it's exactly the same. For receive, you would, yeah, you would do call and kind of receive of array. Oops. Uh, and to show you. Yeah. It's because of this, what, what we call the storage association order in Fortran, whatever. Fortran um, um, tells what doesn't guarantee. So, uh, so I mean, that's true of any Fortran, well, is it? In the old days, it was true of any Fortran routine. You could pass a, a matrix and pretend it was a vector. Uh, modern Fortran would probably complain a bit about that. Um, so, again, if you're a modern Fortran programmer, that might look a bit weird, but if you're a, yeah. 20, 30 year old, if you program for four times more than 20, 30 years, this looks quite sensible. So I appreciate it. So generation thing. But yes, you can do that, which is useful. That's, that's nice. Uh, people want to ask about in C, can you do this kind of thing? Well, yes, you could do it if you did. If you did uh, in array of 10, 10. MPI send, send, I can't type, of array 10, MP, uh, 100, sorry, MPI int would work. Uh, if you do int double star array of, of horrible malloc calls. This, this trick relies on the array being a, a 10 by 10 array being a contiguous block of 100 integers. That is true for statically allocated arrays. If you start doing stuff with malloc, mallocs and mallocs and dope vectors, whatever C programs like to call them, you have to really know what you're doing. So you need to know what you're doing there. So dynamically allocated multidimensional arrays in C are horrific things. Um, uh, but static and allocated. The only reason we static and allocated to see in Fortran arrays is they're transposed. They're just, I've never understood a bizarre convention that uh, one is row major and one's column major. I've never understood the reason for Fortran's choice that it got there first, so I guess it could do what it wanted. Here you don't care what the order is. The order of send and receive is the same, it's just 100 integers quick. If you start, you really need to know what you're doing if you start doing multidimensional um, mallocs in C. It's a bit horrible. Why it works in Fortran is the allocate call in Fortran is, 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 a, is part of the language. So Fortran can make sure that it doesn't matter if it's no raise and allocatable or statically allocated, they're the same. The problem in C is malloc is just some random library routine. So it, it, it's not part of the language really. So it's a bit horrible. Uh, so, if there are no other questions, we're about on time. What I'm going to do, so I, I'm, there weren't any lectures there, but I hope you found that useful um, because I think it's really important to understand the subtleties of send and receive uh, before you start to think about more complicated things. And that's what I'll talk about in the next talk, which is non blocking communication. So, uh, said if you program with stand, synchronous send, you're going to get problems with deadlock. If you program with standard send, it could be synchronous, so you're going to get problems with deadlock. How can I write a robust deadlock free program when my fundamental send routine might become synchronous? 
well, you use another, you use a concept in MPA called non-blocking, which I'm going to cover uh, after the break at half past three. So if there are no more questions, I'll see you back here at half past three. And before tomorrow, I'll try and update the online documentation to reflect the fact that, apologies for this, but the I had a rather hacky solution to get rid of these error messages on the DAC, which was revert to some old software I found lying around that didn't have these errors. The software has gone with the upgrade, so we're using more modern compilers, more modern libraries, which is nice for the Fortran programs. It means you can use Fortran 2008, which is nice. The annoying thing is you get these spurious error messages at the start, which I apologize with, but that's we're going to have to live with that. On your laptop, you know, your mileage may vary. It probably works okay on your laptop. This is this is specific comment about the DAC. The, 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 the data analytics cluster. It's not a general comment about NPI, it's just a quirk of our setting, which I'll try and get fixed if I can. So I'll speak to you again at half past three, just over half an hour, and I'll give a lecture on non block communication and then talk you through the practical. So thanks everyone. See you back in here in about half an hour. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm just going to get set up for the lecture. Um, back on schedule now. Uh, if anyone has any questions they've thought of over the break, just please type them in and I'll answer them. Um, and I'm just going to get set up for this. Um, um, okay, so as I said, I'll make it, I'm going to wait a couple of minutes just for people of our time. Um, um, as I said, if anyone did have any questions, please just type them in and I'll answer them before I start them. I like to But if not, okay, so um, the, the basic issue we have um, is that um, if we program with synchronous send, we can have problems with deadlock. And if we program with standard send, then it might be synchronous we have program with problem with deadlock. And that's most clearly illustrated in the pattern here of communication, where we imagine a communicator, um, where we have a, a communicator and we have one, two, three, four, five, six processes, and they're all sending to each other in a ring. So what's happening is they're slightly strangely numbered here, but each process is sending a, a, a message to its neighbor in a ring. Everyone is sending around to the neighbor. And this is actually the communications pattern we want to um, uh, use in the, we are going to use in the exercise. Now I haven't had time to cover it in this curtailed version of the course, but um, this is actually a very, very common communications pattern in real scientific and technical programs. If you take a domain and divide it up in lots of subdomains and you have some kind of boundary swapping, you need to swap the data from the extremes of one boundary and you need to ex exchange boundary data with your neighbor because your neighbor needs to know what's going on on its, its local area and some of that data is stored on another process. You end up doing something called halo swapping, you swap boundary. And what will happen typically is you will swap a boundary with your neighbor, the neighbor will be swapping a boundary with their neighbor, and on and on and on and on. And if you just program that naively, saying everybody do synchronous send to their neighbor, you will get deadlocked. Because by definition, this process is voting this process, waiting for them to pick up, this one's phoning this one. Everybody is phoning their neighbor and nobody's picking up. As I keep saying, even if you do those MPI send, there is a danger of deadlock because it, it might be implemented asynchronously, in which case there's no problem. But if it's implemented synchronously, there is a problem. So how do we implement patterns of, of communication like this uh, safely in MPI? Well, um, the mode of an operation which we've talked about, the mode of a communication determines when its constituent operation is complete. And that means synchronous events. This is a formal definition. Formal definition of saying, if I issue a sy synchronous send, when do I define it to be completed? I define synchronous send to be completed when the message has been delivered, like a phone call. If I do an asynchronous send, I say that message is completed as soon as the message is in the network, or as soon as the letter has been posted, the email has been sent. I don't wait message to be received. But MPI has another concept called the form. And this is when controllers return to the user program. So normally, what you'd expect, if, if, if I issue a, a send operation, send will take place. And that send routine, the function implementing that send, won't return control to the user program until the operation has been completed. So you'd expect on return from synchronous send, the data hadn't been delivered. However, you can imagine 
Um, uh, and these are called blocking operations. So they relate to when the operation is completed. A blocking operation is the standard function of subroutine call, only returns from the subroutine or function of the operation has completed. And these are the routines we've used so far, NPIS send, NPI receive. You know when the S send returns, the send is completed, i.e. the data has been delivered. You know when the receiver returns, the receiver is completed, i.e. the data has, has arrived. And it's because of that blocking, because they block for completion, that you get the problem with deadlock. What we're going to do with non-blocking communications is we're going to separate initiation and completion. We're going to have a function, a, 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 um, a form of these functions, which is non-blocking, where we're going to say, could you please start sending the message, but return control to me immediately. I'll go on and do something else. And later on, I'll come back and check if that message has been delivered or not. And so we separate initiation from completion. And this is an MPI speaker's called non-blocking. Now you may have elsewhere heard this kind of something going on in the background called asynchronous. People often refer to asynchronous I.O., where you initiate the I.O., please write this 10 gigabyte file, and you come back later on to um, see if it's finished. But the MPI, strictly speaking, synchronous and asynchronous, uh, refer to whether the message passing operation is like making a phone call or posting a letter. Whether the, the function returns control to you and something continues in the background is called the, the form, which is blocking or non-blocking. Very subtlety there. The non-blocking operation, I, I, I issued, I, I, I um, um, envisioned a, a, a synchronous send as like sending a fax. On the previous example, I initiate, I sent the fax, I stood here until I heard the beep doing nothing. What a non-blocking operation does, it separates initiation and completion into two separate function calls, and initiation returns control to the user program almost immediately. Uh, and then you can do something useful. And what I've done here is I've pulled a lever and then gone back and um, and waited for the facts to, to actually be sent till I hear the beep. So I separate initiation and completion and I stick something in the middle. Now, you might think, people immediately think, well, this is great. It means that I don't have to wait for communication to finish. I can do useful work in the interim. However, this work could also be a communication. And in practice in MPI, the most... Um, common use of non-blocking operations is to avoid deadlock. So you initiate an operation and then it returns control to you immediately. And before the operation is completed, you're allowed to do something else. And that could be another um, message passing operation. For example, you could issue a receive in here. And because if this were the send, it doesn't wait to complete, you've broken the deadlock. By not waiting for the send to complete, then immediately issuing the receive, you can break the deadlock. So all non-block, Non-blocking operations should have matching weights. So you have to basically, you'll see here, I've gone back and waited for it to complete. Sometimes people don't wait. They initiate they take a non-blocking operation. They never come back and test or wait for it to complete. That's the equivalent of a memory leak. Um, it, it causes MPI to silt up. If you never wait on your non-blocking operations, MPI has to remember more and more and more of them and eventually it will fall over. The important point is that there's nothing magic about non-blocking operations. If you issue a non-blocking operation and immediately wait for it to complete, that's the same as a blocking operation. We have, we have two calls, an initiation and a completion. By having them as two separate calls, it allows you to pull them apart in the user program and do something useful in the middle. And so these non-blocking operations are not the same as sequential function calls or something calls as the operation continues after the call has returned. Now you could have some mental model for that. You could imagine that MPI spawns off a helper thread and keeps things going in the background. That's not really defined, but what happens is the operation conceptually carries on in the background while return, while, while you get um, control is returned to the user program. So um, we now have three phases. Rather than saying, please do a communication and wait for it to finish, we have an initiation phase saying, please do this communication. We then do some other work in the in the because the, the control comes back to us immediately. We can do some other work and we can do something like in fact, other communications is actually the most useful thing to do. And then we have to wait for the initial communication to complete till we can proceed. So we have three phases, initiation and, 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 and completion, initiation and waiting, and we do some of the work in the middle. And so uh, a non-blocking send is a bit like having an outbox. The analogy isn't, isn't, isn't perfect, but it's a bit like saying, if I rather than saying I want to send a message, please, say, please send this message, 
and me waiting synchronously, or well, well, consider synchronous send all the time because synchronous send is the one which has the, the obvious uh, problem for deadlock. If we issue synchronous send, normally we'd wait for it to complete. Not blocking is a bit like having an outbox and saying, look, there's my, there's my um, message. Could you please deliver it sometime in the future? I'll go off and do something else, and I'll come back and see if it's been delivered. The reason the outbox analogy is 100% um, useful is that there is no copy taken. That's the important point. You are saying, please deliver this message sometime in the future, but don't take a copy, just, just deliver it. Okay? So the, 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 the closest analogy I have is, is sending, a, a, in, as opposed to sending a message via um, um, the post, where you post it and then you just hope for it to be delivered. If you ever send a parcel via courier service, you go to a courier, you say, here's my parcel, please deliver it to my, um, my auntie in Australia. And you give them the parcel and some money, but they give you something back, okay? Which is, not when you deliver a letter, you just stick the letter in the letter box and off it goes. When you deliver a parcel, it's slightly different. They give you something back. What do they give you back? Or what, what can you do with a parcel delivery that you can't do with a normal letter delivery? Can anyone have a guess? What, what does the courier give to you when you, you give them a... Yes, a tra so, so they give you a ticket, a tracking number. So you say to the courier, please deliver this message, and they give you back a ticket. So you get back a ticket. And it's up to you to remember that ticket. It could be, if it's online, it might be a tracking number. If it's physical, it might be a piece of paper. But you have to remember that ticket because you're going to come back. The important point is there could be multiple non-blocking operations outstanding at once. Because the next, I could, I could go to the courier and say, please deliver this parcel, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. I can have 10 parcels outstanding. That means I'll have 10 tickets. I have to remember all these tickets. When I go back to the courier, I want to say, look, um, has this parcel arrived, please? Has this parcel arrived? And the same is true of MPI. When you initiate a non-blocking operation, MPI gives you back a ticket. It calls it a request. It's up to you to remember that request. That is your handle, your link to the, to the operation. And you have to remember it. And people often forget that. So a non-blocking send is a bit like having an outbox. Um, a non-blocking receive, you can have non-blocking receives as well, is very like having an inbox. So rather than saying, um, I'd like to receive some mess, I, I've reserved a receive buffer, this is my receive buffer, and say, I'm going to receive a message into there, and I'm going to wait forever. What you say to MPI is, look, there's my receive buffer. There it is. When the message comes in, put it in there. And I'll come back later and check to see if it's arrived. So non-blocking receive, which are probably as useful as non-blocking send, is very like having a, 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 an inbox. Inbox, outbox, they're reasonable analogies. So what we see here is what are the handles used for non-blocking communications. You have the same data type as for blocking MPI. You have a data type, you special the data type and the communicator, but you get back something called an MPI request. So in, in um, the Fortran 2008 interface or in C, it's a type MPI request. In the standard Fortran interface, it's an integer. But MPI gives you back this handle. So you, so you don't, it's not, you, when you go to Courier, you don't say, please send this message. And by the way, I want you to call it message 957. You say, please send this message. And the Courier gives you back a ticket number, which is sort of a random number. But you have to remember it. So you have to remember these requests. So if we look at the prototype, if you look, Non-blocking synchronous send, the prototype is the same as, 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 as the blocking operation, except for two differences. One is there's an I here. Um, Non-blocking operations proceed with I. They're meant, to, they're meant to simplify or indicate immediate. This is, so this routine, because it begins with I, will return to you immediately. All you're doing here is initiating the send. It will return immediately to you, not waiting for the send to be completed. But you also get back a request. So you get back, at, um, so you have to pass a pointer to a request, I'll show you an example in a second, and that's returned to you. In Fortran, you do MPIS send, buff count, data type, death tag, com request. Again, this is now type integer, but it's the same prototype. Later on, you can say, right, I will now wait. I will wait for that request to complete. I, can say, I, will, I will wait for this particular request, and this request is hopefully the request here. So if I match these up, I'm waiting on the request is the identifier for this communication. And there's a status variable here, which isn't particularly important. I'll come back to that later. Now, 
As written, if I issue a non-blocking synchronous send and immediately wait on it, I have achieved precisely nothing. I cannot stress this strongly enough. There's nothing magic about non-blocking operations. If you issue a non-blocking operation and immediately wait on it, you, you have achieved exactly nothing. You're saying, um, when a message comes in, uh, here's the message, okay, and then you're, const you're just constantly looking at it, waiting for it to go. You don't get a chance to do anything else. But by being, by being two function calls, it allows you to stick code in the middle here. You have to do something here. You have to pull a lever or do something in this blank space to achieve anything, anything useful. So I'll stress again, there's nothing magic about non-blocking operations. If you issue a non-blocking operation and immediately wait on it, that is identical to the blocking for Non-blocking receive, it's very similar. You do MPI I receive, it's an immediate operation, so they receive. Buff count data source tag com request. So you get back a request. Same with force track. Buff count data source tag com, you get back a request, which MPI gives to you. However, there's something missing here. There's something in a normal receive, which we specify, which I've not specified here. Can anyone spot what it is? Normally in a receive, you actually specify not just the receive buff, you specify something else. So mentioned. Uh, no, well, yeah, no, but you've also, well, that's the source. It, when you do a normal receive, you have to specify where the data goes, which is the receive buff, but normally you also specify where something else goes. You specify another parameter in the receive. You have to specify a status exactly. You have to specify now. The point is the status gives you information on the message that was received. By definition, on return from this MPI I received, no message has been received because it's it returned immediately. So the wait, the status is is delayed until the wait. A wait says wait until this send this receive is completed, and fill in the request for me. So when this wait is completed, you know two things have happened. A, the receive is completed, and B, the status has been filled in. And then you can do all your normal stuff and look up the status to find out where it came from and such like. Um, MPI remembers if the request is for a send request or so there's only one request, and MPI remembers if it's a send request or a receive request. If you wait on a send request, the status isn't particularly meaningful. I think the only use, you can cancel messages in MPI. It's a horrible thing to do. But you can basically you could basically initiate initiate a non-blocking send, cancel it, and when you did the wait, I think what happens the status will say this message was cancelled. I think I mean, to be, I've never to first approximation the status is not relevant if you're waiting on a send request, but it is relevant if you're waiting on a receive request. But there is only one wait operation in MPI. MPI remembers internally if it, if the request is a send or a receive. So blocking and non-blocking. So people often worry about this, but you know, the analogy is, you know, if I make a phone call on my mobile, somebody can receive it on their landline. If I email somebody from Microsoft Outlook, somebody can read it on their Android phone or their you know, with their mail, their Mac mail client on an iPhone. I mean, basically, send and receive can be blocking or non-blocking. A blocking send can be used with a non-blocking receive, and vice versa. These non-blocking sends can be used any mode, synchronous, buffered, or standard. Um, what the synchronous mode says is, is it, it whether a send is synchronous or not uh, defines when its constituent operations are defined to have completed. But it's still, if you call it a non-blocking form, it's still initiated immediately. So this gets so 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 the concept of synchronous, asynchronous, blocking, non-blocking do kind of overlap with each other. But um, hopefully, that in the next slide, I'll be able to explain a bit. So if you're going to use synchronous sends, MPIS send then you'll sometimes often want to use the non-blocking form because by doing synchronous send, you run the risk of deadlock. So you want to use non-blocking IS send. As a res by the same reasoning, if you program with standard send, you always have to assume the worst case with standard send, which is that it might be, that it might be synchronous. So you, if you use standard send to write deadlock-free programs, you often end up having to use uh, I send. Receives are always synchronous, which can give you a problem, and so I receive is often useful. An analogy I often use is um, if I'm doing um, a controller worker situation, if I'm the controller, I might send lots of work out to you guys, and I want to wait for, for you to complete. So I might issue a blocking receive, 
with source MPI any source. So I know that when you guys finish, you're going to send me some data. But I'm sitting here saying, okay, this is a receipt from any source. When any of your data comes in, it arrives. And I look at it and I go, um, okay, there's the data. But you might want, want me as the controller, I'm just doing nothing. Why don't I do some work? What I could do is I could issue a non blocking receive, say when the data comes in, put it there. And I could go off and do some other work, and I could come back later and wait for a message to come in. The non-blocking receives can be useful to have receives, always have a receive posted, but you can just come back and purely, we'll see how to check later on. You can come back and check to see if anything's come in. So um, that could be useful. NPI, if you use buffer and send, you don't have a problem with deadlock. So although the routine NPI IB send uh, exists for completeness sake, it's not of any functional use. If you're using explicit buffer and send, which people tend not to do, but if you are, you don't have any problem with deadlock because you're, you're, you're sending emails, uh, sending letters rather than making phone calls. So, but it exists, but you would never use it. Um, there's not any point to use it. So MPI send and IS send and MPI I receive. For the exercises I recommend you use, better, you, you use MPI IS send because by programming with synchronous send, you're, you're, you will only get the right answer if you use the non-blocking operations correctly. So again, program with synchronous send is deliberately making your life difficult, but that's that's deliberate because to overcome that difficulty, to overcome the deadlock issues, you have to correctly understand how to use non-blocking operations. So, as I said, you might you might want to wait, which is I have a ticket, take away I'm going to wait. It's going to stand here until that's completed. Sometimes you don't want to wait. You just want to say, look, could you tell me if this is finished yet? Has this received completed now? The send completed? And that's called test. So MPI, wait, wait for the operation to complete. And if it's when it's completed, the status is filled in. MPI test says, has this operation completed? And you get back a brilliant flag, true, false, one, zero, which says if it has completed. If it has completed, this flag is true or one, then the status will be completed based on that message. If uh, the flag is, is, is false or zero, then it hasn't finished. So you can test things. Um, there is a slight issue here, though, that testing is manual. What, what you would like to do is to say, here's a non-blocking send. When it's completed, tell me through a signal or something, through an interrupt. Or here's a non-blocking receive. When a message comes in, just wait, give me a call, OK? Interrupt me. That's not how MPI works. In MPI, you have to manually check. So programming in this non-blocking way can be slightly awkward because you have to manually come back and check every now and again. It's slightly, but there, um, you are not woken up. You'd, it would be nice to say to MPI, you know, there's a non-blocking receive. When it comes in, could you please just give me a tap on the shoulder and I'll go and deal with it. There were message passing systems which did that. There were active messaging where when a message arrives, it triggered an interrupt handler, but that's not how MPI works. So here's an example in C. Um, it's slightly contrived, but it's just to show you how to do the um, um, to, to do the syntax. We've got an NPI request to request an NPI status status. If rank equals zero, I'm going to send this data to um, to um, rank one. I'm going to send the array, which is ten inches to rank one. Now I could just do it synchronously here. But, um, but I'm, I'm purely using this piece of code to illustrate the syntax. It's not an actual thing, but it does it. I'm doing it non-blocking just to show you how the syntax works. But imagine I want to do a non-blocking send. This says, queue this up. Uh, lost my code. Queue this up, OK? But return control to me immediately. Then I can call a routine, do something else while IS10 happens. So that allows me to do something. And in the example we're going to do, you'll actually issue a receive. But here we're just some generic routine. And sometime later, I say, I'll wait for the send to complete. I have to wait on the request. And that request is this request here. Okay? That's why this is waiting on this send. If I'm rank one, I'm saying I want to receive the message. And again, for some unspecified reason, I'm doing it in a, in a non blocking fashion. Please receive the message, which is 10 integers uh, from zero with tag tag in MPI com world into the receive array and give me back the request, which I can then later reuse to refer to. I do something else while I receive happens, and later on I come back and I wait on that request to finish. And when that request is completed, the status will be initial, will be, uh, will be filled in. Four times just the same. 
So yeah, so as I said, so Ben is saying, is this useful for sending large messages? So so yes and no. So um, what people um, immediately think of is this is going to be useful for overlapping communication and calculation. If I've got a large message to send, I can queue it up and it will happen magically in the background. And um, then I can, so, so that's what it, in practice, it's quite a subtle point. That's not really, that, that doesn't, that often doesn't work. What people most use non blocking communications for is to break deadlock, to have a functionally correct program which is deadlock free. Yes, you can write a program where you've got a big message to send, you say, please start sending this message. You go away, do something else, and come back, wait for it to complete. So you're trying to overlap communications and calculation. However, it doesn't really work in practice because you've got this idea that MPI is this magic thing which delivers the message. But MPI is just a program, it's got to run somewhere. So while MPI is, <laughs> there's no magic here. Basically, MPI is consuming CPU cycles. So I, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to, to really, to convey, but actually this is not, MPI is not particularly good at overlapping communication and calculation. Um, for very, very large messages on Archer, then it can be done. On Archer, the network is clever enough that MPI can say to the network, here's a message, please deliver it, and really just do it yourself. There's enough intelligence in the network, it can really stream the data off, and you can then go and do something else. But that takes a lot of setup cost, and so it's only useful for very, very large messages. And um, so, yeah, it's only useful for very large messages of, I would say, I don't know, tens of megabytes or something. And messages in MPI, unfortunately, tend to be very small. So in reality, most MPI programs are latency dominated. They're dominated by the time it takes to do all the setup, which has to be done. But it's a good question. In principle, yes, it ought to be useful for sending large messages in practice. You can try it, but it often doesn't work. You can, there are benchmarks. If you want to know, is my machine any good at overlapping communication and calculation? There are benchmarks you can download. I think if you just put MPI, if you Google the MPI overlap benchmark, you'll find it, and it'll tell you how successful MPI is. Um, sorry, so in Fortran, it's just the same. Um, we have uh, same syntax, except we have an error variable and the, the, the status in the Course, a 90 version as opposed to 2008 version is a uh, is a is an integer array, but it's exactly the same thing. So ah okay, so uh, someone's asking, can you batch them up? So yes, yeah, so that's the next ah the very judicious question. That's the next uh, slide. Well 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 answered. You can test away for completion of one message, all messages, or completion as many messages as possible. So the routines are. Uh, I don't list them all, but they're all there. So test or wait for one is test wait. Test wait complete is test or wait all. And what you do with test or wait all is exactly as you said, you stick all the receive all the requests into an array and say, wait for all of these to finish. Test or wait for completion as many buses as possible. You can do there's a routine called test um, test any, wait any. Wait for one of them. You've got you've got a lot of non-blocking operations outstanding at once. You've got a whole bunch of requests that you're remembering these tickets, and you're saying, wait for more to complete, wait for one to complete, or wait for some. That's test wait all, test waits any, test wait some. The thing about test wait some is if the prototype's quite large because you give an array of requests and you get an array of flags back saying these are ten requests, that one completed, that one didn't, that one completed. But a good um, paradigm for programming, which is exactly what you've sort of, um, uh, which, uh, which you have um, sort of alluded to there, if you want to send and receive lots of messages, the kind of general advice is issue all the receives, all the sends at once, and then say to MPI, just wait for them all to finish. Just let MPI sort it all out. So in a standard halo swapping code, you might be sending data up, down, left, right, you might be receiving up, down, left, right. You issue that eight communications you issue in a non-blocking fashion. You stick them all in a big array, all the requests in a big array, and you just say, wait for them all to complete. And that allows MPI to resolve them, match them up as and when they come in. Rather than saying to wait for the upward one to finish, the downward one, the leftward one, the right forward one, that can be, it's the efficient thing is in general, just send them all out, 
post all your communications and say to API, wait for them all to finish. So testing non blocking communications is like having multiple inboxes. And you wait for all to completely different comms. So a single wait call applies to a single communicator. So if you look at the prototype, uh, NPI wait or NPI test, uh, ah, oh, ah. So, no, okay, yes, you can. That's a good question, I've never done that, but yes, you can. So the ticket will, the request encodes all the information about the communication including what communication what, what communication was in. So I've never done it myself, but a single wait call could have tickets from different communicators. So that's a good point. I've never thought about that. But yes, typically I've not done that, but there is no reason why you're waiting for a particular communication to finish, regardless of um, what communicator it was sent to. So that was a good question, thanks. So I would give the wrong answer until I looked at the prototype. So casting, by, by casting on the fly, do you mean sticking them in an array or I don't quite know what you mean by casting here, um, terminology. So I'll just get the question up. So I can find my cache. Problem with multiple, what does that is my code. Change lots of says and wait, then cast. So what do you mean by cast in this context? Mean copy them to their final destination, or do you mean a typecast? Don't quite understand the question. Sorry. Okay. So in fact, the, the, yes, you can do that. But the efficient thing is, uh, yes. So uh, can I see what you see? So the efficient, most efficient thing is to actually receive the data right where you want it. So rather than receiving it to temporary buffers and then copying it, um, receive precisely where you want it. Now you might say, well, where I want it isn't a single block of data. It might be, um, halos in general can be, um, boundary values of arrays are not contiguous chunks of memory. So um, you can do copy and copy up, but I don't have time to cover it on this course, but by using derived MPI derived types, you can have strided types. So you can avoid this casting, this copying by directly sending from and receiving to the target the source and destination arrays. However, if you are for some reason receiving into a temporary buffer which you copy, then what you can do if, is you can basically do a, um, uh, you could do a, you know, if you have, if you know you've got eight messages, you could do loop over eight times, MPI wait any for them to complete, find out which one completed and copy. And then what you're doing is you're processing them in as they come in rather than waiting for more to finish. So yes, Theoretically, that is the the um, the uh, most efficient thing to do. Whether it, whether it gains you anything in, in practice, I don't know. But it's relatively straightforward to code up. And so, yeah, I have seen people do that. You know, they chain up the sends and receives. They um, probably wait. You would wait for the you would, you would then loop over your receives as the receives come in. Don't don't say wait up, wait down, wait left, wait right say like, wait for somebody to come in, who was it? Okay, I know where to put that, process all the receives, and then you probably wait for the sends to complete because you need to know that they've gone before you can complete. So, so a most sophisticated approach is to, is to, as you say, on the fly, bring in the sends and then wait for the receives to go up, uh, bring in the receives and then wait for the sends to go. So that's kind of how you could do it. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, So there is a routine called send receive. So a lot of people use this routine because of a simple situation. Now the exercise we're going to do, which is sending a message around a ring, it is a simple situation. We have one sender and one receiver. And so you could use this routine. Uh, so I mentioned it here, a lot of people have heard MPI send receive. MPI send receive just says, you want to do a send and you want to do a receive. If you post the receive first, it will block and you'll never do the send. If you post the send first, it will block and you'll never get to the receive. If you specify all the parameters for send and receive together, there's a single routine MPI send receive, and MPI will guarantee to sort out the deadlock. So MPI will implement them at, at the same time. So MPI send receive is just all the parameters of the send and receive together. 
it, it can it can be useful for writing dead, avoiding deadlock in simple situations pairwise, but it doesn't generalize. And so I would recommend learning the general non-blocking form, which allows you to write a more general send issue lots of sends, lots of receives, and wait for them all. Uh, however, send receive does work. If you look at the source code, because a lot of NPI implementations are open source, if you look at the source code, you will see that NPI send receive is probably implemented as non-blocking send, non-blocking receive, and await. There's no magic here. They've just implemented it. It's just a handy convenience. So I'm not a particular fan of send receive. I know some people are. Um, but um, uh, anyway, that, that's why I mention it here. It's not as generally applicable as non-blocking. So I would recommend you learn the non-blocking form, which generalizes to more high dimensions, non-unstructured grids, um, unpredictable communications patterns. Send receive only works pairwise uh, in 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 well-constrained situations. I appreciate the exercise we're going to do is exactly that situation, but that's just because the exercise is simple just to make it tractable. So the exercise is, I talk rotating information around in a ring. So what, if I go back to my original picture here, what we're going to do is we're going to um, send data in a ring pattern. We're going to arrange our processes in a ring and send the data around. And what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to actually use this to do a global summation. Again, I keep saying you shouldn't do this. If you want to add up lots of numbers globally, you should use the reduction in the collectives. But again, it's a very useful training exercise, this one. So what we're going to do is in this situation, if everyone sends to their neighbor, if you do it six times, then the data from everybody has gone around to everybody. If you pass these buckets around the chain six times, everybody's seen all the data. So you can all add the data as you come in. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass the data around a ring, add in the data we just received, keep going. And if you do it in this case six times or in general n times, you can everyone can add up all the numbers. So I'm a bit more explicit if you go to the web to the web page, which thankfully Claire has fixed after I managed to delete half of it. Thank goodness for revision control systems. Um, I um, the exercises are right at the top here, aren't they? No, no, in the first, I'm cutting my own exercises. Um, I need to share that now. Well, I guess it's not obvious to me. Now. So, um, we're now sharing this um, this screen here. So the exercise is we've done power computation of pi. There's a comment on timing MPI programs. Um, the, the the exercise I don't go through, but it's it's the reason I to to, to know how to send and receive work to learn how they work. The pi example is actually um, a good one because you have this slightly not. It's, it's not a completely trivial communications pattern. You have n minus one workers sending to, to one controller. If you want to work, the question people often ask is how fast is my network? What you do there is you rank a ping pong code, where rank zero and rank one, rank zero sends a message to rank one, rank one sends it back to rank zero. You just keep sending the message back and forward. And by doing that, you can measure the, the bandwidth. You can measure the latency, which is the delay, and the bandwidth. So if you send a gigabyte message and it takes five seconds, that's a fifth of a gigabyte a second. Um, it's useful, it's fun to write, but it, it doesn't illustrate MPI programming so well. And it's quite hard to get to, to get something useful because here, if you want to measure the network bandwidth, you need to make sure that your rank zero and rank one are on different nodes. If they're on the same um, laptop, if you have a multi-core laptop, then the, MP, the messages will just be in shared memory, they'll be abnormally quick. So this is where your MPI get processor name is useful. There will be ways in your batch system to say, could you please put rank zero and rank one, process it on different nodes, and then you can get them to print out, hello, I'm rank zero, I'm on node, and the, the name you get from MPI, get processor name. And if rank zero and rank one have different processor names, they'll be on different um, nodes, and so the message will actually go over the network. But so I, I, I don't um, go through this here, but I leave it up there just for fun. Um, but the one we want is rotation information around a ring. So what we're going to do is step one, we have four processes, not one, two, three, have data A, B, C, and D. And there are there are two fours here. There's a four because we have four processes, but there's a four because we have four steps. And we need four steps to make sure that every 
all the data goes around all the processes. What we do is we send our data around, we add as it comes in. So after one iteration um, process, um, this process two has C plus B, C plus B plus A, and eventually C plus B plus A plus B. So everybody, uh, in the intermediate phases, they have different results, but at the end, they, if they add up the data they receive, and you do this four times, you'll all get the same number, at least with integer arithmetic. And because, so it, because addition is um, associative, then, um, well, here, here I'm relying on commutative, it's going to be commutative as well, but intuition is both associative and commutative, I get the same answer. Um, so at each iteration, a process receives data from the left. I'm sorry, I'm trying to scroll again. Adds the VAT value to the past data is just received. Now, um, what I can imagine here, if we're in this, we're not in the classroom here, but what I do here is I, I get a group of people together to, to do this as a play acting exercise. I get them to write their age on a bit of paper, and we, we, we pass their ages around the ring, and everyone adds up their age, and we, we work at the average age of people by dividing the sum of the ages by four if there were four people. Um, I, they can use any number, I don't insist they use their age. Um, for this example, processes don't have an age, we just use the rank. So you should write a general program, but if we pass the rank, and also you know what the answer is. So if you add up the ranks, not to, if you have P processes, then the sum of all the ranks is P, P minus one over two. It's just, you know, naught plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five up to P minus one is P, P minus one over two. So four processes, you should get six. Four times three over two is six, which is the same as naught plus one plus two plus three. Um, so um, write a program for a global sum using this single ring method. Each pro program process needs to know the ranks of its neighbors in the ring, which say constant. You, if your rank, rank, you send to rank plus one and you receive from rank minus one. But remember, rank plus one, you have to wrap it around. So if you're rank n minus one, rank plus one isn't n or here p, but zero. If you're rank zero, rank minus one isn't minus one, but p minus one. So when you compute your neighbors, they're rank plus one and rank minus one, but you need to be careful to complete the circle. But you just basically send to rank plus one, receive from rank minus one, and do that. Add in the data you receive, and do that four times, and the data goes around the circle, and, and you get the right answer. So you need to think a bit about that, but I, I've got a slide on that um, here, I have a to get back to sharing. So, so there are there are many possible solutions to this, and I illustrate this maybe easier from a physical classroom. But one thing you can do: imagine I'm one of these processes in a line. So I have neighbor. I'm going to call it out the way. That to me, that's rank plus one, and that's rank minus one. I could do a non-blocking send to the forward neighbor. So I could say, rather than, if I try and send my forward neighbor, if I say, I want to send you a message, and I want to do it synchronously, okay? We're gonna do this synchronously. That will deadlock, because my neighbor is also sending to their neighbor, who's sending to their neighbor all the way around, and someone's trying to send to me. We're all trying to send, and nobody's receiving. Everybody's phoning, and nobody's picking up the phone. So you think, well, why aren't they picking up the phone? And you just wait forever. Because we have this ring structure, if everyone does a synchronous, if everyone does synchronous send, we're guaranteed to deadlock. So what you do is you say, okay, there's my message. I have a red one. You say to MPI, there's my message. Deliver it to my neighbor up the way, okay? But do it, do it non-blocking. So, so okay, give me a ticket back, but just, just deal with it, okay? Now I'm free. That's progressing. I'm free to do something. I could issue a non-blocking, a blocking receive to my backward neighbor. I could now say, right, I'm going to wait for a message to come in. And that blocking receive I'm waiting will match their non-blocking send, okay? So that will match this. And then I have to go away and I have to basically wait for this to complete because I need to know that message has been delivered before I can do the next iteration of the ring. And I add the number and pass it on. So you can do a non-blocking. You could also, the opposite, you could, do the, you could say, right, I know I'm gonna get a message from my neighbor, so I will issue a non-blocking receive. If, I, if it was a blocking receive again, everything you're receiving and everything you're sending, you get dead. But you say, look, when the message comes in, put it there. Then you could issue a blocking send to the right and say, right, I'm going to wait until that is sent. 
and that would match their non-blocking receive into the, and then you can come back and wait for the message to come in here then you finish that iteration or you can do both you can just say as um, I think it was Keith said you can just say right non-blocking sent to the right non-blocking received to the left and wait for that to go and this to come in and then you carry on so that's so it's actually worth programming up all three of these because they have subtly different synchronization issues um, uh, and the the one issue which is subtle about non-blocking operations is, <laughs> um, is I'm just trying to get rid of this. That's an annoying. I've got rid of it. Um, is you have to be careful that, and, and this is surprisingly easy to get wrong with this exercise. And, and start next week, I'll go through the solutions and point out the, the common errors people make. You must not. This is one of the few. NPI is designed so you don't normally have to care about subtlety of synchronization. You don't have to care if you're running ahead of your neighbor or behind. If you're running ahead and the issue is sent, it will get there. If your issue received and there's no message, someone's running a bit slow, you wait for it to come in and, and everything's fine. With non-blocking operations, you do need to care because if I issue a non-blocking send and I come back and alter that data okay, before I do the wait, I don't know in between initiate, initiating the send and, and waiting for it, when the data was sent. So if I issue a non-blocking send, alter the data, and then wait, I don't know if MPI sent the new data or the old data. It's like me having an outbox and saying, if I was, if I was important enough to have a secretary, saying to my secretary, saying to him, could you please photocopy this document, please? And before checking whether he photocopied it, scribbling over it. I then don't know if my secretary has photocopied the, the, the change or the unchanged thing. The same is true with receive. If I say when the data comes in, please put it there. If I scribble on that data, I don't know if I've overwritten a receive that's happened or if I've written to it before the receive happened. So I issue the wait. So you initiate it with a non blocking send or receive. You wait for it. In between, it could have happened. The, the actual communication could happen right at the start or right at the end. You don't know. So in that, in between initiation and completion, it's up to you as the user to ensure that you don't alter the data because MPI is not taking a copy here, it's dealing with the actual arrays you've given it. That's the thing that people get wrong. Notes, your neighbors don't change. On iteration I, you're not sending to, each iteration you send to your right-hand neighbor rank plus one and receive from your left-hand neighbor rank minus one. You just do that multiple times. You don't alter the data you receive. It's, if you look at the, um, a lot of people when they program this up, they, um, it's maybe, um, I have to share, it's awkward here, sharing multiple screens. A lot of people do the wrong thing. For example, each time they send out their rank, no, what you're supposed to do is you to receive data. From you. Obviously, to kickstart the process, you send your rank out, that's your initial data. But in the steady state, you receive data from your neighbor, you add it to your running total, and you pass the data on unchanged. You receive data, you add it on, and you pass it on unchanged. And that's what we see. This data A is received and passed on unchanged. You don't keep passing out your rank. You don't keep passing on the running total. You receive, you, you receive the data, you act on it, you add it to your local total, but you just pass the same data on. The data is going around an array. So um, I go back to the slide. It says here, you do not alter data, you receive, you receive it, you add it to your you pass data on change on the ring, and also, you also, you must not access the send or receive buffer until communications are complete. You cannot read from receive buffer until after a wait on I receive, you cannot override to send buffer until after a wait on I send. And actually, this is surprisingly easy to get wrong in this example. Um, when you program it up, it's very easy to get this wrong. You sometimes luck out. In this version of the code, with a non-blocking send for technical reasons, you sometimes luck out, but you should program this one. This is more challenging. You have to get everything right here, otherwise you get the wrong answer. And I will illustrate that next week. So there's a question. Um,
Okay, sorry, I'm getting a false positive. It, it appeared to be someone that had asked a question, but, but I'd already seen that. So that's the exercise. Um, yeah, okay. So as I said, um, I'm not gonna, what I'll do is I'll, I'll now for the next half hour or so, I'll, I'll be available um, for people if they have any questions. Now, obviously, but if you're gonna go on and do the, um, do the example. I don't supply any code, but you should just write um, code where you declare a send buffer, you initialize it to your, your own rank, you send it to rank plus one, you receive data from rank minus one, you do that lots of times. And if you if you do it correctly, everyone should add up all these P values to get the right answer. And in this simple example, we initialize data with our rank as opposed to some age. You can check the answer as P, P minus one over two. Or if you initialize the data, I'll share the screen again. If you initialize the data to be, um, if you initialize the data to be uh, p rank plus one squared, you should get p p plus one two p plus one over six. It's one of these. So if you if you if you're on three processes and you initialize the data to rank plus one squared, you've got one, four, and nine, which adds up to and it's fourteen. And I'm saying that's equal to three times four is 12 times seven is 84 over six is 14. Yes, so it works. It's worth checking both of these uh, if, if you want to do that. Um, if anyone has any questions, please ask them. Uh, so I'll be around the next half hour till we finish at five to one. But if you're working on the DAC, I, I, I haven't had time to, I only discovered this this morning, apologies. If you want to use the DAC, when you log on, you don't do the module stuff. You don't do funny modules, you just work with the default module and you'll be able to compile and run programs fine, even including the Fortran 2008 interface if you're a modern inclined Fortran programmer. However, you will unfortunately on the DAC get these spurious error messages complaining about there being no network, which we don't care about because we're running on one node, but apologies for that. I'll see if I can get that fixed for next week. So if there are no um, questions, or I said, I'll be around for half an hour if there are any chat questions that people have. Um, and um, I'll, I'll just be doing some work, but please just do a chat uh, if you have any questions. Or we can screen share if, you have, if you're have carrying problems with your code. Uh, we can screen share and can grant you privileges and we can have a look at that. Uh, it's up to you. But that's the end of the lectures now. Can't we leave some time up? I didn't labor the point too much. Um, um, you could do the ping pong example if you want. It's quite fun, but it, it doesn't. If you can pro, if you program up the pi example, that is actually more complicated than the ping pong example from an MPI point of view. So I would, you know, uh, carry on with the pi example if you want to do the ping pong. But my recommendation is to try the message around the ring. And what I'll do first thing I'll just, next week is we will come back and. Um, I get the training. Up. What I'll do the first thing next week, same time next week, is I will go through the ring solution. I'll talk about collective communication. I keep saying you should not program this up in this way, but it is a very useful teaching exercise. And we'll do the, we'll do the efficient way. We'll talk about collective communications. And the practical next week is to add the numbers up, not by hand, but using this collective routine, which is called reduce or all reduce. And what is interesting, if you've got stamina, is to compare the, the speed, and you will see that the native implementation is way faster than the one you've written. However, the message rendering is a very useful programming exercise because it, it may seem synthetic, but the programming, the, 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 the pattern of data transfer is, is, is very common in, in, in uh, message pattern power programs, which do boundary swap. It's exactly the, the problem you have. So it, it, although it's a one-dimensional example, it illustrates those features very well. I'll shut up now and, and I'll be here for questions if you want to do now. If you want to chat. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks everyone. I hope you'll be back next week um, for the final session. So thanks. Uh, the question is important, what's the best way to send a derived type is you my type? So um, there is a way in MPI 
of um, sending structures as single items. But this is where you run into the problem um, that MPI isn't a compiler. So in your code, you'll have a, a, a definition of, of the derived type. Um, and, uh, um, and what you have to do is you have to also tell MPI what it looks like. So if in your code, and there's actually, if I get the exercise sheet up, one of the exercises is actually about this. Or as I said, in this version of the course, I don't have time to cover it, but um, here we are. So this is the exercise seven. So in C, you might say structure compound, int i val, double d val. In Fortran, you might have type compound, int i val, double prism d val, n type compound, and you can do type compound x, y, so if you want to send, so this might be your this might be your 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 fundamental type in your program. You might be writing a electrodynamics code where you have particles which are compound object. I mean, really, really nice in MPI. Say MPI send five particles, and you can do that, but you have to tell MPI what this structure looks like in gory detail because there's no way MPI as a library can know because this this object is only created by the compiler and instantiated at runtime. So there are, there's a, you have to define your own structure called um, MPI, an MPI type struct, where you, you create your own data type. So, so you saw that every send receive routine took a data type. For every predefined data type, there is an MPI data type, integer, MPI integer, double precision, MPI double precision. If you define your own types, there are, there are data type creation routines. So there's data type creation routine called MPI type create struct or the MPI type struct. They change the name. Um, my uh, I think it's a rationalization of uh, the MPI type create struct. So what you have to do is you have to tell MPI that I've got a structure which is an integer followed by double precision bound number. So you think you just have to say, okay, MPI, the, 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 the structure, I'm calling it a structure because it's a derived type in Fortran, is one integer followed by one double precision value. But actually, well, in C, the compiler has a lot of um, leeway as to how it lays this thing out. It, it can put padding between the members so you don't know where if there's padding between the integer and the double precision value and in this case there probably will be because compilers like double precision values that sit on eight byte boundaries so this probably has four bytes of padding here so how do you tell that how do you tell mpi that this thing is an integer followed by a double precision number but it actually occupies 16 bytes because it's four bytes integer four bytes of padding and then eight bytes of double you have to tell MPI the byte displacements of every member of the, of, the, of the structure or derived type. So the prototype is pretty horrible, but you can do it. Now, technically, in four, so C has guarantees of what this thing looks like in memory, and the, the compiler has, a very, has, has latitude to do what it likes. In Fortran, technically, the layout of the structure is totally undefined, but in practice, I'm sure, practice you cross your fingers and get away with it. So it does work in for because we all know under the hood. We know all know that under the hood the four time compiler is just creating one of these guys. But technically it's not defined. But technically if you click create an array of these things it's not defined if it's if it's an array of structure, structural arrays, four time can do what it likes, but of course it, it doesn't. So anyway, so that if I get the data creation routine uh, which is let's have a look. I have it on the screen here. You should see this. I did this on man MPI type create struct on Cirrus. Um, MPI type create Fortran. MPI type create struct. Count array of block length, array of displacement, array of type, new type IR. So in this example, count is two, which says there's two types. There's an integer and a double. Um, the array of block length is how, how many there are. And that's one one, because there's one inch, then one double. And the array of types is MPI integer, MPI double precision. So all these things, count array of block types, array of types, are, are nice. You can just read them off. The problem is this array of displacements. You have to actually tell MPI, uh, by the way, the first integer is at byte displacement four. This, it's, 
So what you have to do is you have to create one of these objects in your code and take addresses, memory, this is one of the few areas where you have to tell MPI about, MPI talks about bytes. You have to take the memory addresses of them, um, yeah, and then, and, and then do that, so it's a bit of a horrible. Um, MPI pack, um, I don't cover MPI pack because I didn't pack up. There was a there was a, a message passing system called PBM, sort of a parallel virtual machine, which was popular in the nineties, especially in the US. But MPI rapidly displaced it, and the model for M, for PBM was declare buffer, pack data, pack 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 pack, um, end pack send and on the other side you receive an unpack so you had a had a pack send unpack model one of the design features of mpi is to allow you to, to avoid explicit pack you should be able to send data directly from source to destination and so although you could argue that packing is good because you send one big message not many small ones it will have an overhead and i find it rather rather un MPI like in my opinion it's there historically because it was a, a, the model that PBM used which was one of the initial but it was around in the same it was sort of the homo neanderthal ancestor it was a neanderthal to, to MPI's homo sapiens if I want to be um, if I want to be um, a bit um, derogatory but um, nothing against neanderthals but uh, I it's not the, it's not a model which I which I use. If, if you're sending, yeah. So do you use it, Ben? Do you send it for sending mu multiple data types, like an integer array and a double array in the same message, or do you send, use it for packing up data from various locations into a single block and sending it? If that was, so you know you can pack anything into a packed message. I, I said I don't use MPI pack. Um, I haven't used it myself, although I am aware of the syntax. But but yeah. So actually, you can. There are there are there are by using structures or or, or strided types, MPI type vectors. Okay, if you have. There are ways. I mean, I guess I don't have time to cover them in this curtail course. But there are there are MPI. There are if you have an array and you want to send not a single section of it, but you know, element one, nine, fifteen, twenty-seven, thirty, thirty-one. You can build an MPI type, which which is, well, there are various types. One's called a vector. There are more general types, which basically is a a template which says, and you can send that as one. Object. So if I want to send elements 1, 5, 9, 17, and 18, I create an MPI type and I can do a single send, I specify the array, if I specify this, this type has gaps in it, it automatically just sends the data I want. So their MPI is doing the packing and unpacking. I, I would think of that as a more elegant, a more MPI-like way of doing it. For multiple data types, it's harder and unless you create, structures can have multiple data types, slightly contorted to there I would probably send if you had doubles and integers I'd send the doubles as one message and integers another. I mean the problem about packing is that it depends how big your messages are, but you know modern parallel com modern computers are very slow at copying data. So that's why one of the design features of MPI was to try and avoid explicit copying because copying data is is slow. Um, so I don't know, I'd have to time it. Um, yeah, so the pack type, yeah, so pack type is, it, the pack type is, um, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I need to see the, I mean, it is, it is a reasonable way of doing it. Um, I, 
My guess is it will be much for muchness in terms of speed. I don't think it'll be a big deal, but um, it's worth, yes, it's worth trying. It's worth trying. How much data are you sending in a send? Is it like kilobytes or gigabytes or megabytes? Or? Right, okay. So um, doing one of the problems with, with data types is that Relatively simple things can be quite hard. You need, um, so they can be very useful and kind of, uh, I, at some, they, they won't admit to it, but sorry, they won't admit to it. This is the part, at some level, MPI is just packing the messages for you. I mean, you know, at some level, MPI is creating a single contiguous message, but, but the idea of vector types is that you don't do the pack yourself. You say, please send elements one, five, nine, and 17. And MPI will do that in the way it thinks is most efficient, probably by packing them together. But but it could, if the network, some some networks support drive and transfer, so a very clever MPI implementation on top of a clever network could avoid the packing. That that's the rationale. Don't pack. Describe your data pattern at the highest level, and in all these things, the rationale is always let MPI decide. Let MPI decide if to pack. Let MPI decide whether to be synchronous or asynchronous let MPI decide, but unfortunately using data types can be slightly tricky. So a lot of people do explicitly pack and unpack, I appreciate it, but but um, might be worth trying an alternative. So is this a regular grid code, is it, or is it like an unstructured grid or? Possibly, although again, co copying is copying. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, to be honest, it's more a question of elegance. If you write the MPI code, it will look more elegant. You'll do MPI send all the data at once, comma, buffer, and it'll look nice, rather than explicitly pack, send, unpack. In principle, the MPI implementation would, could be more efficient, whether it is in practice. You need to measure whether it, it might be faster, whether it actually makes any difference is another question, but um, that's a useful question. And as indicated in the timetable, we'll resume uh, next Wednesday, the 21st um, at 1.30 uh, GMT. Um, and I will start off by going over the solution to the ring exercise and try to illustrate some of the stuff that these non-block communication that, that entails. And then we'll talk about collectives and, um, and, then we'll talk, and then we'll do the exercise again.